Happy Easter, LifeGate Church. It's so great to be here together with you on this Resurrection Day. If I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you, I'm Les Beecham. I am the lead pastor here at LifeGate Church, one church in five different locations, and the Lord has impressed upon us that we will have 40 locations in the next 40 years. Can you imagine a live service like this in 40 different places simultaneously? Won't that be cool? It's awesome. We're not only here at West Dodge, we're being watched and worship is happening at Midtown here in Omaha, at Papillion, and in the, in the nation of Serbia, in one city, Novi Sad, and in another city, Belgrade, and we're all worshiping together. Can you give a Easter shout out to all the campuses? We love you. You're awesome. I want to say to my Serbian brothers and sisters, Christos vas kurse, which in Serbian is Christ has risen. And so we're so thankful that they are with us. God is up to something very, very big. I want you to know, you may not see yourself this way, but God does. He sees you. He loves you. Whether you think about him a lot during the week, his thoughts are always on you. The scripture tells us his thoughts about you outnumber the grains of sand on the seashores of planet earth. One estimate was given for one square foot of sand over a billion grains. That's a lot of thoughts about you. And he wants you to know, because he impressed upon my heart, he has you here by divine appointment. It's not by chance. It's not even by evolution. He's been working in your life because he loves you. And he wants to show you more of himself and all that he has available to you if you would be willing. So if you needed to hear that, it was for you. And I believe that with all of my heart. We're experiencing what I would call almost a miracle, if not a miracle, in the Omaha Metro. You're seeing Love Can. You're going to start seeing lovecan.net on cars. Hopefully next week it will be on your car. And this represents 40 churches who are declaring to the Omaha Metro year after year, God is within reach. Healthy, loving people are within reach. That's why I'm trying to work on you, okay, so that that's the case. <laughs> His salvation is within reach. And the expression of that is these five weeks starting today, Easter, Love Can is happening. What is Love Can? It's a decision by these churches, 40 of them, to all preach the same message with variations of style and all of that during the five weeks. Now, you all don't understand this. <laughs> to get a pastor from another church to preach the same message I'm preaching and vice versa is just like, we're in heaven now. This is a miracle. <laughs> okay? But when several years ago, we tried to get three churches to, on the same weekend, speak on the same subject. It was like, do you have to do it in the morning? Uh, do we have to take an offering? Can we do this in the evening? Are you sure we have to do it? And it was like that. But God has done something. You know what he's shown pastors and churches in this region? It's about the kingdom of God, not the congregation of mine. Now, this is so important. So you're a part of about 30,000 people who are hearing words like this throughout our city. They work with you. You play with them at the gym, a variety of things. You may not even know them. But what we're saying and declaring is love can. Love can cross borders that seem impossible to cross. Love can make it through walls that seem impenetrable. Love can define us. It should define us. Love will unbind us if we will allow love to do this. Love can break walls. Love can do anything. One of the expressions of this kind of love is starting next week, we're going to help you with this. We're going to ask every person represented in these 40 churches to make a decision to do an act of kindness or compassion once a day for 35 days. 35 times 30,000 is over a million acts of kindness. And you can do it. You, you can open a door for someone. I, this week I had two ladies open doors for me. I, I didn't even know how to feel. The second one I, I said, this is amazing. Thank you. 
She said, this is starting something new. I, I don't know. And, and so well, we're going to call you to do that. Love can. It sounds good, doesn't it? Love can do anything. The government can't, but love can. I can't, but love can. Politicians can't, but love can. And hatred and animosity can't. Prejudice and violence and bias, they, they can't. Apathy can't, but love can. And so we're declaring this because our God is love and love can do anything. I believe that love can. I believe when you let love loose, powerful, powerful things happen. But when you really think about the statement love can, it, it sounds a little hypothetical. Love can. It, could, you could take it, well, love could. Or, I mean, love should or it might, but love can? Can it really? And so I want to talk about the reason why love can. Take your Bible if you have one. If you don't, it's going to be on the screen. Or you can share with the person next to you if they don't let you. Look at them and say, you're not Christian at all. <laughs> Let's just be honest with each other here. Christians share. Followers of Jesus share. We're reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. People were saying there's no resurrection, no such thing. And Paul's giving the evidence that Jesus rose from the grave. That's what Easter is all about. He says in verse 3, he sums it up. I don't know about you. I like things real simple, real clear. He makes it real clear. This is Paul the apostle. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. Would you say first importance? First importance. In the Greek, first importance means first importance. It's amazing. <laughs> that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day. That's it. Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he was raised on the third day. Well, how does this prove or help us prove the reason love can? Three big reasons love can. Here's the first reason. Love did what it took to free us. The scripture says Christ died for our sins. So rather than love can, Jesus instead is love did. Do you know that Easter is based on love did something? Love didn't just talk about something. You know people who talk big but do little? Well, Jesus did big. Love did. Have you ever been halfway through a project and you wish you had a do-over? I'm colorblind, and so I was um, repainting my deck, and so what's the matter if you're colorblind? I, I had gone to the store, I got the, the, the repaint, and so I'm painting it, and my wife comes home, and the next I have to do the railings, and she says, you do know these paint colors are not the same. I said, yes, they are. She said, no, they're not, because I can't tell the subtleties, you know? Uh, I'm wearing a green shirt right now, by the way, and, and so... She said, no, they, they really are not. No, I said, it, let it dry. <laughs> so we, we let it dry. <laughs> she said, see, there, it's not the same. I said, shoot, shoot. So I went back. It wasn't the same. I got to repaint the whole thing. I needed a do-over. We need do-overs all the time. I mean, it's really crazy. I was, I was in the dorm in college, and it was, it was an all-guy dorm, and women were not allowed on the floor uh, unless uh, once a quarter we let them come in and we cleaned our rooms and bathrooms up and stuff. Or someone could be visiting and their sister came or fiance and they could come on the hall, but once they opened the doors from the stairs, they would yell, woman on the hall! So guys would not be guys while they were there, okay? <laughs> and in this case, I don't think they yelled and I was taking a nap and when I woke up, I had to use the bathroom and so I walked out of my dorm room. I had my underpants on, no top, and uh, top, guys don't say top. I didn't have a shirt on. I'd like a do-over, please. <laughs> and so I come out of my dorm. I'm walking, I'm strutting down the hall. You know, you're in your skivvies here, and it feels, yeah, yeah. And so you're strutting, and then I, there's these fuzzy, because I'm super, super nearsighted. And there's three fuzzy people, and I get closer, and I was like, that guy has really long hair. And I got closer, and... <laughs> It was a guy and his mom and his fiance. And it really became clear when they were about this close. And I was like, hello. And I looked at him and I was like, 
I didn't hear you. <laughs> and they said, hi, this is so-and-so. And I said, I didn't shake hands. For some reason, when you're half naked, you don't shake hands. <laughs> I said, it's nice to meet you. And I turned around and I walked back <laughs> to my dorm room. I wanted a do-over. Now, this, <laughs> it's like this in all kinds of areas of our life. But Jesus did what it took to set us free because there are areas we want do-overs that are really, really serious. Things we wish we hadn't done. Things we wish we hadn't said or thought. We all have regrets. All of us have guilt. Did you know Jesus came to take your guilt upon himself and give you peace? People don't realize that. When you meet Jesus, he wants to cleanse you of every sin you've ever done, all the guilty things. Any sin you're involved in now and any sin you'll ever do, he'll give you peace. And so let's just face it. We've all blown it, haven't we? I, I know I have. I've blown it so many times. One pastor received a letter. This person said, I'm 31 years old and I'm divorced. And though I fought the divorce bitterly, I feel so badly. I have no hope that I feel for my future. Often I go home and cry, but there's no one there to hear me or hold me. Nobody cares, it seems. Nothing changes. I continue to fail. I'm stressed out emotionally. I feel on the verge of a collapse. I'm drinking too much. Something is very wrong, but I feel so hurt and embittered that I can scarcely react to others, much less myself anymore. I feel as if I'm going to have to sit out the rest of my life in the penalty box. And I want to say this to you. If that's you, it's not true. You do not have to sit out the rest of your life in the penalty box. Jesus did to free you from the penalty box. Because love did, our guilt can be done. Here's what the scripture says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 in God's love letter. For he has forgiven all of our sins. Would you say all of our sins? All of our sins. And canceled every record of debt we owed. Christ has done away with it by nailing it to the cross. I love what one beautiful follower of Jesus, Corey Temboon, who was imprisoned in Germany in the concentration camps. She says, God takes our sin, and as far as the east is from the west, it says in Psalm 103, he separates it, and then he throws it in the sea of forgetfulness, never to be remembered again. He paid for my guilt. That means I don't have to pay for it. Did you know you can't receive a pardon until you think you need a pardon? Pardon's not just a piece of paper that they give you. A pardon is a statement that you are guilty and I am releasing you from that guilt. One of the biggest things that we have to come to grips with is none of you are good. Oh, you might do good things, but at your essence, you are not good. What's a good person? Someone who's never failed in thought, word, or deed since the day where they were born. And none of us fit that bill. Jesus said this, there's no one good but God. And let me tell you this too, it doesn't matter what background you are. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're a Baptist. You know, I say to some people, hey, are you a follower of Jesus? And their response is, I'm a Baptist. I don't get it. Uh, I say to someone else, are you a follower of Jesus? I'm an Episcopalian. Are, are you a follower of Jesus? I'm a cradle Catholic. Catholic at birth, Catholic at death. Uh, all this is great. I mean, this is great. Those are the labels you put on, but do you have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? All those are expression of religious expressions. But the big thing is, if you're a Catholic, have you devoted your entire life to the Lord Jesus Christ? I don't, I don't mean becoming a priest. If you're a Baptist, have you devoted? It's not just about getting baptized. And I'm for all of these. I'm not against any of them. But Jesus wants you to be really clear. He did so that you could be set free, not so that you could get a church label. Jesus didn't come to rub your sin in. He came to rub it out. That's a great statement, isn't it? He didn't come to rub your nose in your sin. He came to take you away from it and rub it out of you. Have you admitted that you've blown it? Well, the most important things you can do in all of your life is to con convey, I, I really have blown it. No, I sort of blew it. You know, I, I blew it, but not as bad as they blew it. I mean, if you knew them, they blow it all the time. <laughs> I'm a mini blow it, but they're a big blow it. 
I'm not talking about that. You have to come to the place where you're like blind Bartimaeus while Jesus is headed to Jerusalem. Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Have mercy on me. Not love can, love did. If you forget everything I say, Easter is the statement that love did for you. What you couldn't do for yourself. And it did, and it's done. Here's a sec. Go ahead and applaud. This is, this, is, this is good. Yes, Lord. You're getting wound up, Pastor Les. I'm a desperate man. I'm desperate for the distractions of our culture and our social media and politics and everything else to lose their power so that you can see what ultimately matters, and it's that God loves you, and he did the greatest thing in all of time and space. He came to earth, he lived the perfect life, and because he loves you, he did this. Here's the second big idea. Love can because love does all that it takes to empower us. It'd be one thing to free you from guilt and sin, but what about the power to continue living? Did you know a lot of people say, I believe in the resurrection. I just don't understand it. They like to believe about it, that someone actually died and rose from the grave. And Gallup did a survey several years ago. 84% of people who never go to church still believe that Jesus rose from the dead. It's very attractive. By the way, it's a historic fact. By the way, it happened during Passover when there were a million people in Jerusalem. Everyone heard about it. 500 people saw Jesus. If you're saying, I just don't know about this, do your research. There's more evidence about this that you could take to court than almost any historic thing that you could ever think about. But if you ask those 84% if their lives have changed, they wouldn't even know necessarily what that means. Do you see the resurrection confirms our pardon? It confirms Jesus said, I will defeat death, I will rise, I'm going to pay for your sins. If, he, if he'd paid for our sins and not risen, it'd be hard to believe him. So it confirms your pardon, and at the same time, it defeats death, and, and it releases power. Did you know the reason that you can live and follow Jesus and not be the same person you were before is because God gives you power. I call them superpowers. He gives you superpower. And it's the power that wasn't yours and now is yours. And he describes this in Ephesians, the first chapter, the 20th verse, how incredibly great his power to help those who believe in him, who trust him. The same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. Everyone, don't miss this. The Holy Spirit lived in Jesus while he walked on the earth. And then when Jesus was dead in the tomb, the power of God came. Can you imagine that moment? Explosive moment of life. Rose him from death. Never happened, and then he would never die again. He says that same power, that dynamite, the, the, the Greek term is dunamis, that dynamite is going to be placed inside of you. So no matter what you face in your life, you have the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is going to be with you to rise you out of all of the shrapnel and destruction of the divorce that you've had to go, go through. It's going to raise you out of the bankruptcy that you're having to declare. It's going to raise you out of family conflicts that won't go away. He says, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to give you a superpower. I stepped into one of our worship team meetings. Several worship leaders were there and this week. And I said, what are you guys talking about? And they said, if we had to choose which one of the superpowers would we really want? <laughs> and, you know, they were sharing. And then I started to think, I would want his superpower. And that's resurrection power. And if by faith you receive it, you will have resurrection power. And you'll be able to tell it in your life. You'll have power beyond your circumstances. You'll feel it. We don't know what's going to happen in North Korea. It doesn't matter, though. We don't know what's going to happen with Putin and, and all of the things that he's involved in. We don't know what's going to happen in our divided government. Is the wall good? Is the wall bad? All of those things. We do not what, know what's going to attack taxes, health care. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but it doesn't matter because it's not about us being in control. It's about us trusting God to be in control. 
He has superpower, and he's given you superpower, and he wants you to live a super powerful life everywhere you go. And that's why people at work will say, how come you're not all ruffled about this, the downsizing, the this? Now, doesn't it hurt you? Are you just a faker? No, it hurts me big time, but I have Jesus living inside of me. These jobs will pass away. This nation will pass away. This building will pass away. But he says, my word and my ways and my kingdom, they will never pass away. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, it's such a powerful, powerful statement. I'm ready for anything through the strength of Christ who lives in me. You see, when love does, Jesus doesn't just send power down from heaven. He sends his spirit to live inside of you. Did you know Jesus is the only religious figure? He's not really a religious figure. But he's the only religious figure in all of history who promises not to point you in the right way, but to walk with you in the way. Because he says, I am the way. He says, I will walk with you, and then I'll give you mighty superpower for you to be able to do this, because without his superpower, you can't do it. You can love for a little bit, but we run out, don't we? And we need love from God. I'll walk with you. I'll be with you. I'll never leave you. Peter Ruski was a famous, famous pianist, Polish composer, radical diplomat, very popular concert pianist in the United States. One particular concert he was preparing, he was in the back of the stage, and a mother had drugged, drugged, <laughs> drugged her six-year-old son because she wanted him to play the piano, and he didn't really want to, and he could play da 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 and that was about it. So she brings him in, and she's boasting to everyone around her because they have season tickets in, you know, the Orpheum-like place, and Petaruski's preparing, and she loses track, and the boy leaves the row, and he gets this bright idea, I'm going to go up and play the piano. So he goes up on the platform, and he starts playing the piano about two minutes before the great Petaruski is supposed to come up. He starts tapping out. The only thing he knows, and the crowd silences. And then there are always people like this. They started to shout out, whose kid is this? Get him down from there. Who would bring a kid this young to a place like this? And Petaruski heard it all, and he knew exactly what was going on. And he very carefully stepped out, came behind the six-year-old, and gave an added harmony along. So it wasn't just da da da, it was bum ba da 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 And it was amazing, and everyone was silent. They were in awe, but the awesome thing was what they didn't see. He whispered in the boy's ear, don't stop, don't quit, don't give up. Never, never, never stop. That's Petaruski. How about Jesus? When you feel like taking your life, when you feel like quitting, when you feel like there's no hope, to hear his whisper, don't quit, I'm here. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. See, he didn't just come to deliver you from your guilt. He came to live with you forever, to give you power to live the life that he's called you to. Keep playing. Some of you have stopped playing. Some of you are trusting your own power. He says, don't stop, I'm here all the way to the end. Here's the last expression of love can. Love will be the one who keeps you. Now notice, this is not really good English. Love will be the one who keeps you. The one is a person. And the reason I use this, not love will as a force, is because the person is Jesus. I could say this, Jesus will be the one who keeps you. Keeps you from what? Our greatest enemy, death. It says, according to the scriptures, he was raised from the dead after he was dead for three days. John 11, verse 25. I am the resurrection and the life, the one who entrusts themselves or believes in me. Even though they die, and whatever, wh whoever lives by believing me in me will never die. He says, you'll live if you believe in me. Even if you die, now why does he say even if you die if he just said if you believe in me you won't die? Because it's like the guy that I talked to who died and was with Jesus, he really was, 
saw relatives who died and all that, and he'd come back, and I knew he'd been with Jesus because every time he opened his mouth, he'd just weep and weep and weep. And he'd say, you'll never believe how beautiful he is. And, he, and he was, it was so hard for him to live still now. He wanted to die because he'd seen it. And he'd say this over and over again. Pastor Les, Pastor Les, you need to under, understand something. You don't die. We don't die. Your body dies. Your body dies. You are an eternal spirit. It's your body that dies. And then after your body dies, either you're with Jesus or you're separated and you are alone. But it's just your body. Pastor Dave on Good Friday, he put it so well. It's, it's, when you die, it's like a, a veil that you'll just step through. We hate the idea of the process of dying, but you're going to just step through a veil. And, and it's, it's thinner than tissue paper. One boy asked his dad, what's it like to die? What, what is it like? He said, well, son, you know, when we go to our friend's house and it gets late and you fall asleep and you're laying there asleep and, and I pick you up and you don't even know that I picked you up and I put you in the car and I bring you home and your last remembrance was you were there in their house and when you wake up, you're in your soft bed and you look around and your toys are there and all of it's there. That's what it's going to be like be like falling asleep at someone's house and the moment you wake up you're in a beautiful place isn't that comforting isn't that encouraging life's greatest problem is still debt it's not your debts it's debt <laughs> death and so if you're a betting person you can win on this one one out of every person still dies it should be bet on it okay i am going to die someday and so are you it's really hard. If you don't think it's hard for people, have uh, some of your best friends over and serve them some coffee and pie and uh, say, I'd like to talk about debt. <laughs> That's when your friend says, do you have any scotch? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and water, not pie and coffee. And they don't like to talk about it. It's inevitable, though, and let's talk about it at Easter because Easter is a declaration that he destroyed it. Uh, kids were asked to write a sentence about what their view of death was. And true statements, Gilda, age eight. When you die, they put you in a box and they bury you in the ground because you don't look too good. <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie, age nine. Doctors will help you so you won't die until you pay all their bills. <laughs> yeah. Marcia, age nine, when you die, you don't have to do homework in heaven unless your teacher is there too. <laughs> Raymond, age 10, uh, a good doctor can help you so you won't die. A bad doctor sends you to heaven. <laughs> the fact is, there is a deep longing in every one of us to know, where will I be when I die? Jesus says you can have confidence. If you trust me, you will live, and even though you die, you will live. Now, I want to say this. If you don't have that confidence, it brings a shadow over everything you do in your whole life. Every cent that you make, every experience you have, the end is still you're going to die. And if you don't know what's going to happen when you die, you feel it. But it's kind of like when I know I'm going on vacation to Monterey, California. No matter what I face here, I'm going to Monterey. <laughs> it's great. And it just it encourages me. And so knowing you're going to heaven is a great encouragement. The Bible says, because of the cross, because love will, it says this in 1 John chapter 5, verse 11, and this is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son, and I'm going to say in his Son alone. Whoever has the Son by faith has life, and whoever does not have the Son, God's Son, does not have life. Son, life. No Son, no life. I have written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. Do you know that God says when you believe in his Son, when you ask for his forgiveness, when you entrust your life to him as God, no longer you as God, you don't play God anymore, you don't control life anymore, he says he will give you an assurance of your salvation, your eternal life, and your destiny. Deep inside of you, you will know. You will know. If, if, if you ask me sometime, are you, are you overwhelmed with love for your wife right now? I might say, well, I'm not feeling a lot. Then if they ask, do you know you love her and she loves you? I say, I absolutely know. This is rock solid. He wants to give you a rock solid confidence in your life. And if you don't have that rock solid confidence, you may not have him yet. Or he may not have you. Do you know all of us 
are going to do a lot more on that side of eternity than on this side of eternity. I was fearful. I had this tape uh, strip in my back pocket, and I thought, oh, you're going to judge me. That skull's happening here. But it's not. Okay. <laughs> okay, here, here's this. Uh, this is the tape of your life, and, and, and this life on earth is here. See it? Got it? Now, on your tombstone, it's about like that. It's the dash. You're living in the dash right now. Did you know that? But you know what the dash prepares you for? Eternity. When you get to the end, it keeps going. There's no end to it. And the decision you make here, for real, will affect all of this, all of this. We don't like that because we like to control things. Did you know that? We like to control stuff. We like to be in control. We like things to go our way. But Jesus says this, either you can choose the performance plan where you try to be good, try to control your life, try to be good enough so God will notice you and love you and let you into his heaven. Come on in. Jesus never lets anyone into heaven because they performed. All the Peter and Pearly Gates stories, none of them are true. The one question is, have you trusted my son Jesus completely? That's it. Because it's not about the works you do. It's not about being religious. It's not about how many times you go to church a year. It's who you trust for all of your life and have entrusted yourself to. This is the Jesus plan. And this is what sets him apart from every religion in the entire world. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Why? Because he died. I want to pose or pause just a second before we finish and, and help you understand this. Understanding this is not enough. You have to do something about it. And God's amazing. When you just say, I trust you and you mean it, he will do more than you do. He will seize that opportunity. He'll take you at your word, that simple childlike faith, I trust you, I entrust my life to you, and he will start to revolutionize your life. He won't make you a bunchy Christian who's real political. <laughs> you know what he'll make you? He'll make you a lover of Jesus, a follower of Jesus, and a lover of people. Let me say it again. When you become a Christian, you don't start to become like this. You smoke, you drink, you're a Democrat, you're the, that's not, that's not what he's going to do to you. <laughs> when you become a Christian, your heart's going to be so filled with love for him and love for others, people won't even know what's happening. And the challenges and the burdens you face will grow lighter, the guilt that you have will go away, and you will never feel alone again. Because God himself will live inside of you. I'm not real good at spoken word. You know, that's where you just kind of talk the word thing out thing. But I, I was inspired this week to write this down. So let me just have at it, okay? You put up with me, would you? Love can sound so hopeful, but so hypothetical. Like it could make a difference or it might make a move for the hopeless the lonely, the hurting, the guilty, for those sold for dollars in bondage to habits in fear of both life and of death. Are you saying love can or love could or love might? The questions all ended when Jesus won this big fight. Not love can, but love did and love does and love will. On this day, love acted. He did and does still by dying. He freed us. By rising, empowered us to live to the end when he would receive us. But love can? Just a theory. Till you choose to be willing. Surrender your pride, your performance, your religion in exchange for what love did and love does and love will be for you and for me from now on. Love can be. Love can be. Why would Jesus die for my sins? And rise on the third day. Because love could and love did, that's why. Because love could and love did. Thank you for making this appointment possible. 
to let me be a mouthpiece for the Holy Spirit to you. No matter what your religious background, to invite you even now to believe that love did and love does and love will do in you if you would do what Jesus said. Believe that I am the one and that I rose from the dead. Give your sins up to me and let me be God from now on and learn how to do that. I'll show you how. I'm going to come live inside of you. Would you all bow your heads in this room? Everyone's head bowed. No one leaving the room, please. Unless you're about to pop. Now I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes because I'm looking at you and I'm seeing if you're looking at others and if you are, I'm going to look at you and I'm going to point at you, okay? Servers are getting up and moving. Don't let them bother you. Everyone's head bowed. Everyone's eyes closed. And I want you to ask the question, has love done for you and you really have received it? Not just believed it in your head, but let it go down into your heart and you know it. I'm looking at you. Close your eyes, please. Holy Spirit, speak to us. If you've never done that, I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. If you're saying, Pastor Les, I want to pray that prayer of faith. I want you right now to say, pray for me and with me. Raise your hand and put it down if that's you. All over this room, just raise your hand and put it down. I want Jesus. I want Jesus. Okay, we're going to pray a simple prayer. And by this prayer, God's going to take you at your word, and he's going to change your life. He's going to forgive you immediately. You ready? You don't have to pray it out loud. Please don't. Just pray it in your heart. Follow after me. Dear God, today I believe love can. Because I believe Jesus did. And I trust you completely. I give my sins to you because I need a sacrifice. Cleanse me completely of everything I've ever done, am doing, or will do. I receive by faith the cleansing blood of Jesus. And now, Lord, I give my life to you. I want to follow you. I want to be a follower of Jesus. I want to go where you send me. I want to do what you tell me to do. I want to learn how to love you. In the name of Jesus, I trust you. Please hear my cry and receive by faith my simple prayer, change my life. I ask this in Jesus' name, who I now declare as my Lord and my Savior and my superpower. In Jesus' name. Now I'm going to pray for you, Jesus, every person who prayed that prayer. I ask right now that you speak to their heart and that you'd show them, you're mine now. You're mine now. Let's do this life together. You're forgiven now. You're cleansed now. You're free now. Lord, speak it to each person clearly in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you open your eyes? If you prayed that prayer, would you raise your hand so we can see you and applaud you? Yeah. Look at that. Come on. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us today. We always appreciate hearing how God is moving in your life. If you've been impacted by LifeGate Church, we'd love to hear from you. Please email mystory at lifegateomaha.com. Thanks again for joining us.